Guess what day it is? You're listening to the Sports Blast Woo-hoo! with Ashish Sharma. Sharma. The only shortcoming that the Broncos have versus the 07 Patriots is John Fox. I'm sorry, you're not Bill Belichick. Brian Rhodes. Rhodes. Gomes, he was punting beers. I mean, you know how fast a cup can go being punted? David Pollard. Pollard. I would absolutely consider it a failure if they were knocked out in the divisional series. And Mark Lozell. Lozell. It's just a, a collective group. You know, the dirt dogs, they get the job done. The job done. Job done. Oh. The summer's almost over, but we got some news. The socks are really rolling, no time for the Guess who's stepping up to fill the clothes of shoes? Koji's on the mound and we can't lose. Yui, Yui Hara, Yui, Yui Hara, Yui, Yui baby. Koji's on the mound and we can't lose. Welcome in everyone to the Sports Blast 1460 WXBR. I'm Ashish Sharma with Mark Lazell, David Pollard, and oh guys, look who's back. It's Brian Roach in the house. Welcome back. What's up, guys? Good to have you back, Brian. Well, he had a justified uh, two-week hiatus there, and uh, I guess that's why we're playing the song. 2013 World Champions, the Boston Red Sox. Welcome back, Brian. That must have been awesome being at Game 6 last week. It was incredible, man. Yeah, I can, I can only imagine. Surreal, surreal experience. Well, 508-588-9927. Looking forward to taking your calls today and uh, talking about what has been an incredible run for this Red Sox team this year. When you look at... Where they were at the beginning of this season, the expectations coming in. I know I've said repeatedly 88 wins coming into this year. That was my expectation. Coming off what was one of the most disastrous campaigns in 2012. For them to really go throughout the postseason, guys, without even facing elimination yeah. on their way to winning the World Series. I mean, when's the last time we could say a Red Sox team has done that? You'd probably have to go back to, what, 1915 to yeah, see it's, that? It's pretty far <laughs> back, yeah. And that they were the best team in the regular season, and they finished off the best team uh, so, because they had the best record in the MLB this year, so, um, and, and in every category, you know, they were the first or second, so they were incredible this year. Um, insane stats across the board. Pitching was outstanding. It was just an amazing scene to watch. Yeah, collective effort by uh, the Red Sox this season, and just uh, really awesome to watch a team like this. Who at the beginning of the season, uh, you're looking at this Red Sox lineup, saying, "Okay, it's a rebuilding year. This is a chance for." the Sox to get some of the young talent that they have up and into the organization, get them some playing time. And then all of a sudden, you know, you go and this team wasn't even expected to make the playoffs, let alone win a world series. So for them to win the world series, it's, it's amazing. And uh, I mean, you get a little bit of luck along the way and you, and you have the, the performances that you had clutch performances from your big time players. And that's what it takes to win a World Series. It wasn't about the talent here. It was about the determination of the team. And that's one thing we'll get into in this show is the character guys that Ben Sherrington signed, the chemistry that played such a, a huge role with this team getting to the playoffs and just staying resilient in, even when it looked like there was no chance. For example, game two of the ALCS, you're down four runs in the bottom of the eighth with two outs. I mean, to be able to come back and win that game after hitting a game-time grand slam, that's just amazing. And then later walking it off with Salty. But guys, this is the eighth championship in Boston since 2002, and a Boston team since in that time span has now appeared in 12 championship games or a series. I mean, that is mind-boggling. Phenomenal statistic right there. I mean, think about that for a second. Yeah. And this takes me back to a couple years ago. I I remember, uh, let's see, when was this? 2009 when ESPN was doing that whole title town thing. Yeah. And didn't, wasn't it like Virginia or someplace in Georgia that ended up winning? I thought to myself... How can that be? You're Excuse right. me, but I'm pretty sure that Boston deserves to be title town. When you look at what they've been able to do in this past decade. No, it's been an incredible decade for the town of Boston, uh, city of Boston at that. You know, the Bruins, the Sox, Celtics, the whole package, um, Patriots, uh, New England. So uh, they're still considered the, uh, a part of Boston. So, um, yeah, uh, hands down, Boston deserves to be the title town. And, uh, you know, they should rewind that back and actually pick Boston as the, the title town. Yeah, I'd be interested to know how many other cities throughout the United States or within any major league context have have had four teams in the four major sports 
each win a championship. That's mm-hmm. that's kind of incredible when you think about happened. it. That the Patriots, the Red Sox, the Celtics, and the Bruins all have won championships in the past ten years. This one, uh, this was pretty special considering the team that you had. And and I think, I mean, where does it rank for you? Well, uh, maybe New York. I think New York. New York could no, probably no. lay stakes. I don't, to that I don't think. Yeah. Like all four yeah. teams dominated in the same like century. There's oh time, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, and and not even decade. the same century. Not that's the same, <laughs> decade. The same that's, decade. That's, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah, no, and and just to kind of go off what Dave was saying, you know, it's not just that every Boston team has won; it's every Boston team has appeared in multiple championship right. games. Or always series. there. The Patriots have appeared in five Super Bowls. The Red Sox have gone to three World Series in the past, you know, decade and a couple of years. They've won all three. Uh, Celtics won for two. Bruins won for two. So this is really an incredible stretch here that we're seeing. And when you get into the, the discussion of where does this title rank, I know for me, 2004 with the Red Sox, that'll never be beat. I mean, you're talking about an 86-year drought, the curse of the Bambino. You're down three games to none in the ALCS against your most hated rival in the New York Yankees. That has to be number one. Number two, maybe, you know, the New England Patriots. Drew Bledsoe goes down, this unknown Tom Brady comes in, the sixth round, 199th pick overall, leads the team to their first championship ever. I'd have to put that one at number two. But you know what, guys? This one's definitely in my top five. I think it's number three for me. The reason why I think it's in the top five is because every man on that roster, the active roster, contributed in their own way. Uh, You you can talk about Bogarts, Drew, uh, the whole nine yards, and Napoli with a big hit, Ortiz does what he does. The pitching stepped up. It, it was, it's definitely top five because it's just the atmosphere in the locker room is there. The camaraderie, chemistry is full. Uh, it, it was exciting to watch. Yeah, the great thing about being a Boston sports fan is there's something for everybody. And I think that uh, maybe the rankings would change up depending on what team you might follow. For me personally, number one has to be the, the 2004 World Series because of the, the curse of the Bambino being broken and the way that they came back against New York, like you said. Ashish, uh, for me, number two, uh, being a hockey guy, Bruins, when they won the Stanley mm-hmm. Cup and the, the unlikely run that they had with Tim Thomas and the way he played in that. What about the Celtics? You know, that's just like, a nut in the, 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 the hockey Celtics? playoffs. The uh, I don't think there's anything right. like it. And, and the Celtics, too, obviously. Like they you know, I think those first the championships. Championship. Sorry, Brian, what? They went out to win that championship. So Right. No, that team was assembled specifically for that short window. I mean, they said, we'll have these guys max for five years. That's exactly what happened when Rayon left. They said, we are built to win now. And that's what they did in the first year they went out and got it. And the thing is about this year's Red Sox team, they had a, a devastation with, with the Boston Marathon and bombing. And they mm-hmm. stepped up for the city of Boston. So that's what makes it so um, awesome. All right, guys, we're up against our first break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be coming back and talking about David Ortiz, John Lackey, and Daniel Nava, what these three have in common. You don't want to miss it. It's the Sports Blast, 1460 WXPR. Uh Uh-oh, guess what day it is. Guess what day it is. Huh? (laughs) Hey, guess what day it is. It's hump day. Woo-woo! I'm so glad we left that stupid party. No joke. Hey, baby, are you an overdue library book? Because you got fine written all over you. Oh, barf. <laughs> what about that girl with the hoop earrings? Ridiculous. When she was dancing... Megan, I... look out! Look out! <gasps> oh, oh. oh, my God. Becky. Becky, are you okay? My arm. I think it's broken. Can you bend it? It's already bent. In the wrong direction. I can't believe this. I'm so sorry. I only had a few drinks. I was just buzzed. Really? Just buzzed? Yeah, I swear. Well, in that case, my arm is fine. Ah, that's better. You're really okay? You're serious, Becky? No, genius. I'm not serious. Ow! My arm, it hurts. Buzzed driving. Maybe we should stop acting like it's no big deal. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A public service announcement brought to you by the U.S. Department of Transportation, the Ad Council, and this station. Here at the GED Pep Talk Center, we've got a pep talk that can motivate you. Sometimes things don't always turn out the way you want them to. You can improve your future. Now get your game face on and take the first step towards a better life. Hurry up. Don't make me repeat myself. Whatever level of motivation you need, we've got a pep talk for you. Call 1-877-38-YOUR-GED or visit yourged.org for your pep talk and for free classes in your area. GED is a registered trademark of the American Council on Education. Brought to you by Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. The Sports Blast, wrapping up your week in Boston sports every Wednesday night, 7 to 9 p.m. Only on 1460 WXBR. 
Welcome back to the Sports Blast 1460 WXBR. Remember, you can call us 508 588 9927. That's 508 588 WXBR. And tweet us at 1460 Sports Blast. Guys, I want to talk now about the three guys that we just discussed before heading into our first commercial David Ortiz, John Lackey, and Daniel Nava. Three amazing stories in their own right, and we'll get to each one individually. I want to start by talking about the amazing redemption story when we're talking about John Lackey. A couple years ago, this guy, let's see, 2010 offseason, he signed to a five-year, $82.5 million deal by Theo Epstein. He comes here, gigantic expectations, falls flat on his face. A couple years later, as Tommy John misses the entire year, he comes back this year in spring training, and John Farrell's like, you know what? We have a plan for John Lackey. He's going to be a big part of this team. And I remember scoffing and laughing and saying, you know what? This is just lip service. John Lackey is not going to be a major part of this team. They're going to find a way to utilize him for some kind of trade value if they can just get him a little bit, and then he's out of here. But he really changed the perception of himself with the media, with the fans. It's been a total 180. In Game 6, he walks off the mound, and he's getting cheered. I don't think I've ever seen John Lackey get a standing ovation at Fenway Park <laughs> and then tip his cap. What do no. you guys think about that? I thought it, I, I thought it was awesome. I think you got to give a lot of credit to the Red Sox organization, Ben Charrington and John Farrell, for, for seeing something in John Lackey that n- obviously none of us could see. I thought the exact same thing as you, Ashish. I figured after the Tommy John season, this guy was done, and his career would be winding down. But instead he comes back, he has a better season than he's had in a Red Sox uniform since he's been with the Red Sox. And to perform the way he did in the playoffs, which was kind of his billing, he's a good playoff pitcher and a a big-time performer when it counts, the the guy won Game Six and clinched the World Series, and and he was fully deserving of the standing ovation that he got when he uh, when he left the field. I definitely got a Pedro Martinez vibe um, in that Game mm-hmm. Six, though, that when was he a left scary. him in there. Yeah, I, I didn't. I mean, not really to little. not to pick on what John Farrell was doing as far as management, in uh, in a game where it was six to one, and uh, you know, it, it's still it's still the World Series, and prior to that, uh, he hadn't conceded when John Lackey argued. Ar- Lackey argues almost every time he has to come off the mound. He took him out the last few times that he argued. Yeah, what this did time he say? He, he said something like, this is my guy, John. This is my guy. Yeah, this yeah. guy is Matt Holiday. I don't think, yeah. like, he's not uh, Matt Carpenter or something. You're right. coming out of this game. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Brian, because I think a lot of us got sort of that Grady Little uh, vibe when John Lackey, or rather John Frell, goes out to the mound and he talks to John Lackey, and I'm like, uh oh, he's not pulling him. Is he? Is he? Is he, is he <laughs> trying to convince him to stay back on the mound? And then John Farrell walks off, and Lackey's still there, and I'm thinking to myself, this is not good. Yeah. But it ended up working out in the end. Yeah, right? Tommy John definitely did him well. I mean, I, you really talk about John Lackey, the run support. He didn't get much run support, mm-hmm. and he had a 3.52 ERA this past season. Mm-hmm. And had 10 wins on the season with 161 strikeouts. Wasn't there something like the Red Sox were shut out 12 times this year and six of those were John Lackey's? John Lackey's, right. yes. Right. Yeah, that is exactly right. And, uh, and that's it's sort of ironic because they gave him the run support early in game six. And if you're looking at it from the whole season perspective, it was the opposite of, of what it was for John Lackey most of the season. That the team went up six runs, and he shut the door on the Cardinals. And that's mm-hmm. that's yeah. what you need out of your starting pitcher in an elimination game. You didn't want that going to Game 7. I think everybody knows that. You treat that Game 6 like a Game 7 because mm-hmm. you don't want to have to deal with the pitching problems you had. And I was looking Eevee for maybe a coming in. to get into that game, too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He was so effective in that series. And, yeah, and, and, and you didn't need him, which was great. And Lackey this year, he had a, a 7.7 uh, strikeouts per nine innings. And that was uh, co- compared to 2010 and 11, he averaged roughly around six per nine innings. So mm-hmm. it's two strikeouts uh, per game. So. You know, he's been really good. And, guys, it wasn't just what we saw on the field. It was the attitude yeah. surrounding John Lackey. When he came the to confidence. spring training, he, he came time. in He came in, in shape, noticeably slimmed down, saying and doing all the right things. And I think for the first time in a very long time, we saw the real John Lackey. For a long time, the guy that we saw barking at the media, lashing out, that wasn't really him. He felt a sense of comfort. You know, Johnny Gomes came in. David Ross, all these dirt dog guys, you know, they just love the game of baseball. Money does not play a role with these guys. And they came in, and they're like, you know what, John, we're going to win. And John even said it himself, he, you know, spring training, they came up to me, and they're like, we're going to win. And right. Johnny Gomes said, we're going to win the World Get the duck boats ready because we're going to win the World Series. Yeah, and trust, trust breeds confidence, and that's the thing. I think that John Farrell, part of the reason why I left him in the game is because he trusted John Lackey, and that's – 
that's a huge that's a huge thing for a pitcher when you're when you know that your manager has faith in you. And I think that we saw, I mean, how filthy was this guy's curveball? And he was mm. throwing it behind in the count. That's a sign that a pitcher is confident on the mm. mound when he's throwing a breaking ball behind in the count consistently for strikes. I mean, this guy obviously, John He Lackey started just, using that pitch against Detroit. Right. And that's what dominated the Detroit lineup, and that's what Buckholz used to, like, do well against Detroit. And, and they, couldn't, they couldn't hit that curve. And it, it right. was just, uh, I think that more than anything showed me, all right, this guy trusts his stuff right now and sure. i think it's a huge it's you got to give kudos to the management and probably the, the guys behind the plate as well like you mentioned david ross this guy had more confidence than i've ever seen him have since he got here and another statistic to bring up uh lackey actually had trouble with the eight and nine hitters every other hitter was batting like 250 the eight and nine hitter uh the eight hitter had a 316 and the nine hitter had a 282 average Maybe a little loss of focus. A little loss of focus, but he got what mattered. The one, two, right. three, four guys. And that's what you, re- you really look at. Eight, nine guys won't hurt you that much. Right. No, they won't. Right. That's the truth. And, and, it's, and it's really interesting. When you look at John Lackey's contract, there was actually a stipulation in that contract. I don't know if you guys know this, but there was something that said that if he requires surgery on his pitching elbow, that the length of the contract will extend, but the average annual value will, will actually decrease. decrease. So if you look at it from a Red he Sox standpoint. the veterans minimum. Yeah, exactly. Season. So if you're the Red Sox, wow. you're thrilled with this. I, I mean, you're getting that. a good John Lackey for yeah. a a lot less money. Yeah. So this is an absolute win for the Red Sox, and they can hopefully use this to their advantage and hopefully send out the same guy next year. Another masterpiece by Ben Charrington. Absolutely. I, and and we'll talk about him on this show. He's wait, done a fantastic wait. job. Ben Charrington didn't sign the Lackey deal. Oh, yeah. yeah right. That was Theo. That was Theo. Here's, no, here's, why, here's why I yeah, got he still had Charrington. input. Every guy, was, that, no, was in, every guy that we have right now is up at Theo Epstein. Well, 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 right. well, what about the trade that happened? Adrian Gonzalez, Carl Crawford, Nick Poon. That was Ben Sherrington. That gave we'll up get so into much that. money. That freed up a lot cap. of money. And yeah. we'll talk about that later on the show. Go ahead, Dave. The reason I give credit to Sherrington is because he kept Lackey around, despite yeah, exactly. ev- despite yeah. everybody thinking otherwise. I mean, right. I, that's what I'm saying. I feel like something, someone in the organization just knew this guy has this kind of stuff in John him. John And he showed it. Yeah. And, it might have been John Farrell, but you still have to have that Or maybe they checked in on him in the offseason and saw possibly. that he was losing weight. You know? Right, <laughs> right. And, Mark, Honestly, if you do want to credit someone. No more chicken and beer. <laughs> if you do want to no, credit Sherrington. still beers it up, you know. Yeah, right. We saw that picture. Oh, that's the okay. If you win the World chugging. Series. <laughs> yeah, but if you win the World Series or the ALCS or whatever that was from, it's fine. But one thing that if you do want to credit Ben Sherrington, it's got to be keeping David Ortiz around. That's the next guy I want to talk about. Is I mean, he's 38 years old. He's getting better in front of our eyes. This is not supposed to happen. I mean, guys, you remember a couple years ago, what was it, 2010, 2009? They were going to wave him. Years, they were going to yeah, wave yeah. him. They were going to cut him. Mm-hmm. And this is a guy who we thought, oh, he's done. He can't catch up to the high heat. You know, he's losing uh, velocity a- on, Adrian on his Adrian Gonzalez back speed. helped him hit lefties. That, like, that's the one thing we can get from Adrian Gonzalez. Well, and Gonzalez was also kind of good his first year before hitting that wall and hitting like four home runs in the second half <laughs> of 2011. But... But David Ortiz, the resurgence of Big Poppy. He's he's legitimately a designated hitter. He beat he broke the all time record for a designated hitter with with hits. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know his hitting is he he just has an eye for the ball and his swing uh, has been perfect. He's been working on his mechanics, making it quicker. Uh, you know, less input on on the the left leg when he swings. He's and even he, pretty good fielder too. At he first, is. yeah, he doesn't yeah. get enough credit. I mean, he came he up through the lost minors. Some weight. He did, and 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 going back to the first base thing, uh, Brian, he came up through the minors as a first baseman yes, in the Minnesota yes, system. I know that. So, yep. Yep. so you know, uh, that's why. I mean, a lot yes. of people like to say, "Oh, David Ortiz, you can't feel." <laughs> did you see that bad. flip on that, that Lester play? That oh yeah, oh, yeah. Nice. he's a good fielder. I, I actually was looking at some stats the other day. If I were to give you an over under, say, telling you that David Ortiz has played uh, one thousand uh, in two innings. As a fielder for the Red Sox, since he came here, what would you say the amount of errors he would have would be? Oh, I get a lot. Over under, uh, I'll put it at fifteen. Uh, I'd say well, no, I, I mean, I would say now I'll that put, we have this information, I'd nine. say it's under. Now I see where you're going with this, but yeah. I would, if I didn't, I would have said over. Right. So the way I phrased the question kind of blew the answer for everyone. <laughs> yeah, he's did. made, he's made uh, I believe it was 12 errors. Wow. 12 yeah. errors. And in the past, I think, six seasons, he's only made two. Yeah. Now, let's, now, let's not get he's, he's not a gold glover. Yeah, he's, he's not playing a lot, and he's not a gold glover. <laughs> but, but he's, he's serviceable. Ahead of ourselves. But he's yeah. serviceable. Exactly. Yeah. He doesn't hurt you when he's on the field. Yeah. And that's I, I thought it was a good point because a lot of people were talking about, oh, you're going to lose 
uh, Mike Napoli in the field. Well, David Ortiz, hopefully he bats more runs in than he right, lets up. But right. the guy the guy doesn't hurt you on the field. You know, I, plus, I, he was hitting so well, you can't take oh, it. Yeah, I mean, the guy's hitting 700 in the World fire. Series. The rest of your lineup is hitting like 180. Yeah. And, you know, losing Mike Napoli, even though David Ortiz was playing so well, that's just one thing that for three games, losing Mike Napoli in the World Series and still being able to take two out of three in St. Louis, that's impressive. a feat in itself. That is impressive. And honestly. he was first in every category uh, hitting-wise for the Red Sox. Batting average, home runs, RBIs. And that's what you want out of your, out of your three or four hitter. He, he was bouncing back and forth. So Vintage Big Poppy. Vintage Big Poppy is for sure. And the uh, third guy that I want to talk about, guys, I think this might be – I don't want to compare the stories, but this might be the most amazing and most refreshing story I think I've heard in a long time. And to be able to see it unfold over the last three years in front of our eyes, Daniel Nava. This is a guy who was what the equipment manager yeah. Brian you would probably know of like some yeah, random some semi pro information yeah, on Yeah, Statman Roach would have it. Yeah, yeah just uh, like some semi pro team I believe out in California, the equipment manager, he makes the team and then he finds his way into the independent league and he gets his contract purchased for a dollar, makes his major league debut uh, in 2010. It's we all know, we all know the grand slam story <laughs> of it. Joe Bland. I mean, the path that this guy has taken. And then if you take it further to 2013, he came to camp. He didn't know if he was going to break camp with a big league cup club. He, he doesn't fifth, know. He had the fifth best OBP, OPS of any um, outfielder. And didn't he, he had a top 10 uh, batting average this year as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, Number eight, I believe. So, right. So when you look at the path that this guy has taken to be where he was just a couple of years ago to be a world champion today and be a big part of that throughout the regular season. I know he didn't play a lot in the postseason, but he shouldn't feel like he was not a part of this. He was a big, big part of this. It, he's a heck of a player, and it's a heck of a story. You know, he, like you said, he, he was all about baseball. He was the equipment manager. He stuck around. That's the thing about guys that really want to give up their dream. But mm. he loved baseball so much that he just stuck with it. And, you know, he wanted to be an equipment manager for a minor league baseball team. And then he gets a shot for a dollar. And then he hits a grand slam in his first at bat. It was just, it was inc- it's an incredible career for him so far. And just to have a championship under his belt. Is Especially even with like sweeter. a year off from the majors, basically. Because yeah. yeah. he wasn't used at all, um, I think, 2011. So Right. Sure. It's a great underdog story, honestly. And, and he, produce, he, he produces at this level. And it's amazing to see that a guy like that who you purchased for the same price as, like, a bag of Fritos at a vending machine. <laughs> Actually, I think uh, Fritos are more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at least at Target. But, I mean, it's just it's great to, to see a guy like that come up through your organization. You hear about undrafted uh, rookies in football mm-hmm. all the time mm-hmm. that kind of come in and make their staple and make it big in the league. You don't hear about it in baseball. You usually know who's coming up. Sometimes players come out of nowhere, but this is truly – just way out in in left field, no pun intended. But like, <laughs> unbelievable story, Daniel Nava. I I think that uh, he's going to be a centerpiece for the organization going forward too. Yeah, I remember one uh, one time in two thousand. Yeah, Great I hope so. Outfielder. I hope so. And, and you know what? I I hate to uh, put a damper on it, but they could use him as trade bait because of his val- value. If they decide to go with Johnny Gomes as the everyday outfielder in left next year, we'll see. Obviously, how everything plays out with Ellsbury. But I just remember walking down uh, Van Ness Street after a game in two thousand ten. I actually walked right by Daniel Nava's. Parents. Obviously, they were pretty famous for the video camera thing out in the grandstand. I just kind of said, hey, you know, you should be really proud of your son. And they were like, oh, trust me, we are. <laughs> so that was a pretty cool moment. But yeah. uh, Daniel Nava, you know, like Dave said, the underdog story. That's what makes sports, you know, obviously we watch sports for a lot of reasons. But that's certainly one of the major reasons. And that's what makes Boston so cool. You know, you, you never really hear about those kind of stories in other cities. And Boston just has, has this, uh, um, you know, a history of being great, but at the same time, just amazing stories coming out of like like uh, Dave said, left field. So yeah, I mean, when you when you have the uh, the gritty the grittiness of this kind of city and and the teams that play for this city, they have grittiness as well. And that you know, I think it's it's part of the reason why I I think that the Patriots have struggled lately is they don't have the grittiness that some of the other Boston sports teams have had. The Celtics obviously are in a bad spot right now, but, it, you know, recent years, the years they've won the championship, the Patriots did it with gritty defense, and, and the Red Sox won it this, this season with grit and determination and character players pretty much exclusively. The Bruins, same thing. They were not supposed to beat the Vancouver Canucks, and they and they did, and that was come from behind. And 
It's just a it's a great well, city to live in. Luongo if you... was the goalie. Well, Luongo, yeah. <laughs> and, and, what time is it? Bunch... What time is it? It's ten past Luongo. <laughs> <laughs> and a bunch of the Red Sox players really downplay the character part, and they just say they like to play baseball. But right. at the same time, you need that chemistry in the locker room. That's what character is, right? right? Or and, tease and... that speech he gave. That was incredible. exactly. We all awesome. heard the audio of that. And uh, before we go to break, I just want to say Johnny Gomes and Victorino were actually on Conan last night. I don't know if you guys caught this, yep. but Johnny Gomes said, "Look, Ben Sherrington did not go out and get a bunch of rodeo." clowns he got good ball players oh, yeah. that was the greatest you know? line yeah and and that's so true and conan was like well they were once rodeo clowns and he was like <laughs> of course so it's not just about character it's also about getting good ball players uh anyways guys we're up and up against another break but don't go anywhere we'll be right back right here on 1460 wxbr hey there he is how's it going i'm having a stroke are you gonna shake my hand or what i'm having a stroke wow you're not even moving your arm I'm having a stroke. Are you okay? I'm having a stroke. Your face looks weird, too. I'm having a stroke. Are you having a seizure or something? I'm having a stroke. When someone is having a stroke, they may not be able to say it with words, but their body language will tell you loud and clear. I'm having a stroke. You just need to know the sudden signs. Look for FAST. F-A-S-T. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. Or S, speech difficulty. Then T, time. Time to call 911 immediately. Because the sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in their recovery. Know the sudden signs. Face, arm, speech, time. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. Wildfires burn millions of acres across the country each year. And each year, wildland firefighters battle to contain them. But they can't do it alone. For some communities, it's not a question of if wildfires strike, but when. Get fire adapted. Learn what you can do now to reduce wildfire damage later at fireadapted.org. A public service message brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Learn more at fireadapted.org. My name is Mira Batra. I have been in this country 32 years, and this is how I live united. America has always been the land of promise, and in my community, many families have come for a better life. Coming from another culture myself, I know the desire to become part of a community, to feel at home, and to gain the tools for our children and families to succeed. So I advocate for these families with United Way. United Way empowers them to look beyond their histories and to see what opportunities are available. We help them get involved with their kids' schools, network within the community, and when we do, we unite them. We make the community stronger. What I do is something I wish someone had done for me, and I am so grateful I am able to. My name is Mira Batra. I help families see opportunities and succeed. I don't just wear the shirt. I live it. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Go to liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. You're listening to The Sports Blast with Ashish Sharma, Brian Roach, David Pollard, and Mark Lazell. Check us out online at www.sportsblast.co. And welcome back to the Sports Blast on 1460 WXBR. Ashish Sharma, Brian Roach, Mark Lozell, and David Pollard with you. We have now joining us via the phone lines from Nesson.com, Ricky Doyle. Ricky, how are you? Doing great, guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, Thanks for joining us. Uh, Ricky, I wanted to start by asking you uh, about the Red Sox offseason. This past, or rather last offseason, the Brass went out and got their man in John Farrell. So how much of a difference from a mental standpoint for the players did that difference make, going from Bobby Valentine to John Farrell? Well, first of all, isn't it pretty crazy that we're already diving into offseason stuff? (laughs) I mean, I haven't even caught my breath. I don't know about you guys. I'm still catching up on some sleep. (laughs) But, like, you know, I I really, like, I realized that today when I was, you know, writing some things up, that it's like, wow, there really is no break going into these things. There really isn't. (laughs) It's nonstop. but yeah, it's it's definitely a, uh, it's a lot different going into this off season, that's for sure. But um, to your point about the whole, you know, kind of what the mental aspect of it is, is just, I, you know, I think what they did a good job of last year though was taking care of that whole managerial situation right out of the shoot. I mean, they didn't waste any time last off season. They realized that, that was kind of the most paramount thing going into the off season. But you know, it's kind of a, a weight off their shoulders to begin this off season and. 
they can just kind of get down to business, which, I mean, they're in a pretty good position right now. Obviously not in a perfect position. I don't think you can ever say that about a team going into, you know, the winter months. But it definitely, you know, there's only going to be some fine-tuning before next season, which is a good place to be in. Ricky, uh, in addition to John Farrell, the Red Sox acquired a lot of character guys, uh, such as Johnny Gomes, Mike Napoli, Shane Victorino. How much do you think that uh, the team chemistry really played a part in this team making such an unlikely run? Yeah, I mean, that was kind of a, a huge, you know, hot topic debate throughout the season because it's one of those things that you can, you know, you can preach chemistry and, and debate it until you're blue in the face, but there's just really no tangible way to see what kind of impact that it had. But, I mean, I think, I think it, you know, a lot of people want to downplay the whole chemistry thing, but it, it, if you watch this group over the course of the season, you, you have to know that it played an impact. Well, you know, how much of an impact, that's one thing. But I think it certainly played a role, and you know I, I tend to think that you know there's a difference between chemistry and character, and I think that you know chemistry is one thing that can kind of be built if you start winning games. Whereas if you have you know if you add guys, character guys like the guys you just mentioned, you know it makes that chemistry come a lot easier. So I you know I think it was it was kind of a breath of fresh air this whole World Series run because you know it proved that while you you know you still need the talent, but there is a, a certain degree of, of any sport that really that you just it's almost hard to you know hard to pinpoint how much of a how much of a factor chemistry is but I think, I think it certainly played a little bit of a role uh Ricky uh, Ben Sherrington seems to be getting very little credit for his work on this team obviously the biggest thing that he did other than the free agent signings this offseason was the massive trade in 2012 that freed up 160 million dollars in payroll uh why do you think he's getting such little credit here I, I, you know what, I think it's kind of, everybody just kind of took it for granted once everything started firing on all cylinders. And, I mean, it, if you ask me, I think he deserves more credit than anyone. I mean, he was the architect of that whole thing, and I don't think I've ever seen, you know, a display of of general management quite like that going into a season. And, yeah, it's really, I, I don't really know why, to be honest, if he's not getting enough credit. But I think that, you know, certainly John Farrell said immediately after they won the World Series, he kind of, you know, placed a lot of praise on Charrington's shoulders saying that, you know, he deserves all the credit in the world. So I think, you know, there are a certain amount of people. I mean, certainly you guys, maybe we're, we're, we're definitely dishing some praise on him. But it is, it's interesting to see how, you know, everybody's kind of, you know, looking at these these heroes that are playing. And that, well, that's another thing, too, is that I just think there's so much personality on this team. There's so many guys that you can kind of gravitate towards that Charrington, who's just, you know, while he's the architect of this whole thing, is kind of hanging in the background and kind of gets, overshadowed by these, you know, I guess, more vocal guys and the guys that did it on the field. Hi, Ricky. This is uh, Brian Roach. Of the three players with um, qual- who are offered qualifying offers, Napoli, Ellsbury, and Drew, who do you think will accept them? Um, well, I don't think any of them, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's kind of – Ellsbury is certainly not going to. I mean, we know the deal he's searching for, and you know, in excess of a million do- $100 million. Uh, I think – Napoli's, you know, he's in a good position right now where it's, you know, finding a, a a guy with his type of power on the open market is is rare. So I think he could probably command a deal, you know, maybe three years around the forty million dollar range. And then Stephen Drew, I mean, he's just he's such a well rounded player. Even though he had those offensive struggles in the postseason, I mean, this is a guy that, rep- you know, he's gonna represent a, a good, well rounded player in the middle of an infield, wherever that may be. And, I mean, if you look at the infield market right now, Stephen Drew's probably the best player outside of Robinson Cano in the middle of the infield. So I think all these guys are, in, you know, in line for multi-year deals, uh, which leads me to believe that, you know, you might see a deal. The one that I could I could probably see returning is Napoli, whereas uh, Ellsbury and Drew, I wouldn't be surprised if they went elsewhere. But, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll certainly have to see how that all shakes out and how the negotiations go. But definitely I, I don't really expect anybody to accept the qualifying offers at this point. Do you think it was foolish to offer Stephen Drew a qualifying offer? Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't because I, you know, I think it was one of those things where it was almost if he they thought to themselves if he accepts it, you know, that's great. We get another year. This guy is going to provide a lot of depth. And if we saw one thing, it's you know how important depth can be. And I think it also speaks a little bit to you know the season that Will Middlebrooks is coming off of. While they still have high hopes for him, I think there is a little bit of you know reluctance to kind of rely on him out of the shoot. So yeah, I think it was, you know, they went into the whole thing thinking if he, if he takes the offer, great, we got another year of him. But at the same time, we might as well give him the offer because if he rejects it, 
and gets an offer elsewhere, then we're entitled to draft pick compensation. So I think as you know, a lot of things went into the decision, but I think it was ultimately a good move for him. Hey, Ricky, Mark here. Um, what is your expectation for Jacoby Ellsbury this offseason? Will the Red Sox resign him, or has he played his last game in a Red Sox uniform? Yeah, I mean, it's he's a tough one to gauge just because, I mean, it's really – Speed's one of those elements that, as you get older, it, it's really you know it's going to be tough for him to maintain the same type of production. And I think you know it's quite obvious the Red Sox are a better team with Jacoby Ellsbury. I mean he's a he's an elite talent, but at the same time you got to look at it. Are you ready to make Jacoby Ellsbury your highest paid player? And I just I don't see where the Red Sox would be willing to do that. And that it just leads me to believe that you know there's going to be a team out there that overpays. It only takes one, and we've seen it just. You know, no matter how many cautionary tales there are out there in terms of shelling out big money to free agents, there is just always one team that says, you know what, screw it, throws caution to the wind and gives us this big contract. And I could definitely see that happening with Ellsbury. I mean, there are a lot of teams right now that really covet his services, it seems like. And, you know, I, I just think if at the end of the day, when, this, when they're putting the numbers and, and seeing what he's, you know, what his value is for the Red Sox, I think they look at the situation and see a guy like Jackie Bradley Jr. or see the possibility of shifting Jane Victorino to center field and maybe signing a more affordable corner outfielder. It's just, it's tough for them to really, I, I, I would think, at the end of the day, decide, you know what, this guy's worth $100 million. Right. And, uh, yeah, so the Red Sox have uh, six starting pitchers under contract for next year. If they were to deal one of them this off season. Who do you think it would be, uh, Jake Peavy or Ryan Dempster? Um, Tough call, you know, huh? I, yeah, I th- you know, I, I'd also like to see, I feel like there's still a potential they could probably yeah, even add to that mix. I mean, I think when you, you just got to keep an open mind going into the off season. But, you know, out of those six guys, I guess I could I could maybe see them dealing away a guy like Peavy, mainly because of his, his postseason struggles. It's kind of, yeah, he's kind of you kind of have some question marks there, but you know Dempster's another candidate as well. I, and, and honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if all six of them were still in the mix. I mean, we've seen time and time again, not only with the Red Sox but teams across the league that you can go into spring training with you know six, seven, even eight starters, and then you're coming out of you know going into May with three guys, and you're calling guys up. You, you sign on the Aaron Cooks of the world and the Bruce Chens of the world. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I wouldn't be shocked if they actually keep all these guys. But if I had to pick one of those two, I guess I'd probably lean towards Peavy, just thinking you know he might be able to fetch them you know, more more value in the trade market. But like I said, wouldn't be shocked if they kept all six. All right. Well, Ricky, thanks so much for joining us. I uh, really appreciate the time. Hey, anytime, guys. Thanks, right. Ricky. Thank Ricky you. Doyle of Nesson.com. And uh, a lot of interesting things there. Uh, I want to start with what he talked about with Stephen Drew. Uh, not really surprised from his standpoint on getting the qualifying offer. I was uh, because I believed, and you guys can get in on this, but I thought that if there's any position where the Red Sox can afford to lose a guy, it is shortstop. Yeah, they have, they have so Zanzibar many Reds. guys in exactly. the minor leagues. They have Marrero, they have Bogarts, they have My, my other Chichini. thing is $14 million for Stephen Drew, For Stephen Drew, just that's doesn't make sense to me. 14.1, guys. 14.1, <laughs> right. And for Salta La Macchia, not that to get it, I understand, I understand now that Salta La Macchia is definitely not worth one year $14.1 million. No way. And neither is Stephen Drew. But here's the thing. When they have offered it to Mike Napoli and Jacoby Ellsbury, you know what you're doing there. Neither of those guys is going to accept it. They're going for their multi-year deals. And Jacoby Ellsbury, he's looking for six, seven years, a hundred and something million dollars. So you're just protecting yourself by giving it to him so that you can get compensated when he leaves. So I just didn't understand the logic by Ben Sherrington to give it to Stephen Drew because while you can sort of infiltrate the mindset of Mike Napoli and Jacoby Ellsbury, Stephen Drew, I'm not so sure. On the one hand, he might say, you know what, I'm 31. This might be my last real chance to get a three- or four-year deal. But he might say, hey, one year, 14.1, I'll take it. And that's why I think it was kind of scary to actually – offer him the qualifying offer because he would he out of all them i think it would be steven drew that would accept because 14.1 million dollars is long, a, long term though like he probably wants two three years deal i mean scott boris is his agent right so. scott boris right. is his agent. yeah but if the group's gonna stay together for like one to two more years why not try to get another run out of it and because you know? because at this point i would assume that will middlebrooks and xander bogarts are ready to man the left side of that infield i think look right. will That's middlebrooks did not have a good year this year he did not but i'm confident that if he can fix his approach at the plate he can go back to being the kid that we saw in 2012 that okay it was 
was going to lose to Mike Trout anyways in the AL Rookie of the Year. But huh. that guy that was competing for that, I still think that you can get that out of Will Middlebrooks. And I, we saw some of that in August and September. That his, not in October, was, though. Who, not in October, if but he, stays he, healthy. he didn't really, uh, dur- during the end of that postseason run, he didn't get much playing time because Bogarts was walking and, mm-hmm. like, he was, like, sparking a fire, basically. Right. And, and you can't and take out someone who's doing that. And I, I just think, uh, I mean, I don't hate the the offer for Drew, but I think you got to just let him go. Let the young guys take over that side of the infield, start developing, because you won a World Series, but, hey, you still got to develop. Exactly. All right. Well, up against another break, but we'll be right back here on the Sports Blast. Don't touch that dial. You're listening to 1460 WXBR. Welcome to today's lottery drawing. And today's winning numbers are not yours, not yours, and another number that's not yours. And the final number is not yours. When it comes to having money, don't rely on luck. Brew your own coffee at home instead of buying that latte. Brown bag it to work instead of ordering it. Go to feedthepig.org for more free ideas on how to save. Feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. Time now for your WXBR Sports Blast headlines. The Boston Red Sox are World Series champions after beating the St. Louis Cardinals 6-1 in Game 6 exactly one week ago, winning the series four games to two. It's the Sox' third World Series championship since 2004. But Game 6 marked the first time that the Sox have clinched the World Series title at Fenway Park since 1918. The Beards went 97-65 and during the regular season. Major League Baseball named John Farrell. AL Manager of the Year, David Ortiz, was your World Series MVP. Dustin Pedroia and Shane Victorino each won Gold Glove Awards. Red Sox fans got to celebrate the victory at the Rolling Rally, which took place this Saturday. The New England Patriots enjoy a bye week in Week 10. They're coming off a 55-31 victory against the Steelers. Their next game is a Monday night football matchup November 18th against the Carolina Panthers. Rob Ninkovich practiced on Tuesday after being sidelined in the second half of Sunday's game with an apparent foot injury. The Boston Bruins have lost four of their last five games, their latest loss coming last night against the Dallas Stars. The Bees lost in a shootout as former Bruins Tyler Sagan and Rich Peverly both scored in the shootout to put the Bruins away by a final of 3-2. to two. Good news for the Bruins, Louis Erickson was back on the ice last night against Dallas after missing five games with a concussion. The Bees take on the Florida Panthers tomorrow night, face off at 7 o'clock. The Boston Celtics are 0-4 to start their season. They lost their most recent game on Monday night. 95-88 to against the Memphis Grizzlies, and, a, and tonight they will take on the Jazz in a battle of winless teams as rookie head coach Brad Stevens and the Celtics try to right the ship. Tip-off is at 7.30. Those are your Sports Blast headlines. Be sure to check out our website for your favorite Sports Blast segments and guest interviews as well as video highlights of the Red Sox rolling rally at www.sportsblast.co and tweet us at 1460 Sports Blast. Again, that's at 1460 Sports Blast. I'm David Pollard. Don't go anywhere. The Sports Blast continues right now. Excuse me. I'd like to ask you a few questions. It's time for five questions. Five is right up. You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer this question. On 1460 WXBR. Thank you for all your cooperation. 1460 WXBR. It is now time for five questions. And uh, I believe Brian is hosting this edition of Five Questions, and uh, I'm scared, guys. I, I honestly don't know what this guy is going to ask us. Don't know what it's off expect. the top of his head. Yeah, so. that's what he told us. <laughs> yeah. so. I did not I'm pre-plan this, Im- apparently. Improv. So let's, yeah. let's, let's, okay, the, Qu- the floor is yours. Let's do it. Question one, guys. When will the Celtics win their first game? Ooh, I don't next season? Schedule. Is next season <laughs> an, an option? <laughs> I don't think they're going 0 in 82. So. No, I mean they're they're playing Utah tonight. Utah doesn't have a win. Yes, but you need to lose this game because yeah, this you're, is you're facing a team that this is going to be a big one. It's a lottery to pick team too. Yeah, that's true. They need to lose this. That's a good point. Yeah, but uh, both teams uh, are going to try to try to throw this game. So that's why Gerald Wallace is on the bench tonight. I think so. <laughs> I think either Friday or Friday they play the Magic. The Magic's all right, but Saturday they play the Heat. So that might be the time to win a game. But. Yeah, let's just, try, let's just try to piss off Miami's entire fan base and steal one there. It's a really tricky question. Yeah, that no, is. That is. I, I would go Magic. I think Friday in Orlando, uh, Victor Oladipo, um, they got a lot of talent over there. It would be, be a big win for them, for sure. 
I'm going to say I have no idea. I don't know. I got to say that the first time they play like a middle brow team, because good teams I feel like are going to be too good to lose to the Celtics. And when they play bad teams, they're going to have to lose to those teams That's because they have, to, they have to tank it this season if they want that lottery pick. So, I don't know. That, yeah, that's yeah, a, that's I, a really yeah. tough one. Dave, Dave and I are taking the cop out, and we're saying when they play sort of a mediocre a mi- team, middle that's not too good or too I, middle of the pack. I, that is I, that yeah, is our combined yeah. answer, Brian, okay. for question number one. All right, second question: Would you trade Rajon Rondo when he comes back healthy, or would you build around him? Uh, if uh, that's a good one, I mean, it obviously depends on what you're getting back. If you're getting something that's you know close to what Rondo is in terms of other players and then guys that you're maybe planning to build around Jeff Green plus whoever you get in the NBA draft next year, assuming you are a lottery team, I would consider it. I would. But I would have to see on paper who I'm getting in return for Rajon Rondo. Yeah, I like these Celtic-oriented uh, questions. Uh, please co- keep, keep them coming. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would keep Rondo. Uh, Rondo has a lot of value, and when he comes back, he's going to be even more valuable. But I really think if you put Rondo, Wiggins, and Jeff Green together, and I love maybe how Mark's tr- already assuming that the Celtics will get Andrew Wiggins. But go ahead, <laughs> Jabari Parker, Wiggins, uh, uh, Julius Randle isn't coming to the Celtics because he's going to be a point guard. I, I really think Rondo is going to stay. That that's my my belief. I really think Rondo is going to stay. And if they can trade away like you know their future first round picks and maybe package with uh, Brandon Bass or Jared Sollinger, somebody valuable that has a lot of value on the market, I really think that they can get somebody above average to go along with Jeff Green, Andrew Wiggins, Jabari Parker, and Rondo. Rondo, Rondo. Uh, if I had to say, I think that Rondo ends up staying with the Celtics because of what you were saying, Mark, the value that he does have. I think that the organization will want to keep him around. My only question is, is he a guy that you want to build your team around? And I understand uh, that... You know, it's it's still into the future that this team might have another shot to win uh, a championship, but I don't know if Rondo is the guy to really build your core around just because of some of his character issues. Uh, we'll see how he gets along with new it, coach Brad Stevens. It's a fresh team, fresh identity. Mm-hmm. I really think Brad Stevens is going to coach him up, and he's going to be a good point guard in the future. I really yeah. believe that. So I'm sort of copping out again saying yet to be seen. So, all right, the Red Sox will have a dilemma at catcher. Who will they sign? Will they re-sign Saul Tlamachia, sign Brian McCann, or will they just stick with Ryan LaVarnway and David Ross? No, they're not going to go with Ryan LaVarnway and David Ross. They're either going to bring in Brian McCann or Jared Saul Tlamachia. I hope it is Saul Tlamachia, and I'll tell you why. Brian McCann is a guy that has value, guys. I mean, he's a good offensive catcher. He's obviously better defensively than Saul Tlamachia, but he is not going to be cheap. He's looking for something between 75 to $100 million. We all know, as we just said on this show, the long-term big-money deals – have been an issue for the Red Sox. Yeah, you know, you look at Brian McCann, he's, uh, what, 29? He can kind of convert into a designated hitter after Poppy's done. So he does give you value there, but I'm just not willing to spend that much money on a backstop. I hope it's Jared Saltalamakia behind the plate with Ross again. Saltalamakia is durable. That's the main thing right there. Uh, Brian McCann has missed a year and a half throughout his career. So a year and a half of games, so... I, he's br- he's brought production to the table. He's been a, a superb catcher behind the plate. It's just a matter of him being healthy, and I rather go with Salty because Salty's healthy, and you know you can have David Ross, you know, pitch every other day if you wanted to, because uh, the pitchers really have a good chemistry with David Ross, but they also have a good chemistry with Salty. Besides the playoffs, Salty had a good uh, finish. Yeah, I think uh, I go I go Saul to Lamakia. I don't know what the Sox are going to want to do. I don't want to see them go out and get McCann because I think it's sort of the opposite of what their mentality was in coming into this season, which was that, all right, we we already tried this going out and buying the sort. I mean, he's not that big of a name, but still, he wants $80 million over five years. If you're going to spend that much money, go out and get a piece that you need, like a, a center fielder or something like that because you don't have Jacoby mm-hmm. Ellsbury anymore. I would like to see them dedicate their money elsewhere to something other than the catcher's position. So I would bring back Jared Saltalamakia because I don't think that McCann is that much uh, more of an upside to him. Uh, He's definitely know, an upside, but how much more is it? it exactly. How much is, is he the a upside four-time worth? Four-time All-Star. A seven, seven-time All-Star, I believe. Seven-time so, All-Star. But, but the thing is, he is 29 years old. Catchers, we all know, are sort of like running backs in the NFL. Once they hit the 30. 
uh, the age 30 or 31, that's when they start to slow down. And if the long-term plan it's is to point. convert him into a designated hitter, that does change things. However, I am just wary of a deal that goes $7,500 million. It just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, and, you know, they trade away Carl Crawford, Josh Beckett, all the big yeah, contracts, Adrian Gonzalez. Why do it again? Yeah, like, so like, I think it, we all say so. so it just seems like ahead, backtracking dude. to me to, do, to go yeah. ahead and get someone like McCann on this team. But let's yeah. continue. Five questions. All right, number four. Jake Peavy bought a duck boat this weekend. If you had the money Jake Peavy had, what would you buy? Well, how much did he spend on the duck boat? Do you have seventy seven thousand dollars? Oh, okay, seventy seven so grand. So, if we so could spend seventy seven grand on something, or if you just had won the World Series and you had a contract like Jake Peavy had, I don't know if I'd buy a Jeez. duck boat. I'd buy a really nice car. I would too. I mean, I'd you, a duck boat. No, a car. Oh, okay. I mean, hey, I'm not going <laughs> to lie to you. I mean, if I had, like, I, Johnny Gomes on uh, Conan last night was like, I think, uh, you know, PV owns three quarters of the state of Alabama. If yeah. if I had that much property, I, you know what? I would consider getting a duck boat for sure. You know, that thing looks like fun. I'd give little rides to people and be like, hey, you know, you, know, you have to house. have two different types of licenses to drive that, right? I would get a CDL in the other one, whatever the other thing is. Oh, yeah. I'm sure is. you could but, do Yeah, that I mean, too. he's Jake PV. He could do it. But, yeah, if I had that much money, like 77 grand and, you know, some change change because I'm Jake Peavy and I pitch for the Red Sox, I would buy a really, really nice car. I don't know what it is. Maybe a Ferrari or a Lambo or something. And, you know, if I had something left over, I'd, I'd get a duck boat as well. Have you guys seen Blank Check? Yes. That is a great movie. Dude, I love the house that he has. Yes, that is with, a fantastic movie. With the slide movie. going into the mm-hmm. pool from his room, that's what I want. <laughs> that's I, want awesome. I want a water slide going into my pool. Like I want the, that, too. That's, so that's what Mark would do. <laughs> that's all you want? That's all. It, That's it like a hundred bucks. <laughs> no, it's not. A slide? It's more than that. No, no, but a it's slide? not just the slide. No, it's, it's the, the whole house. It's the infrastructure. Oh, okay. It's the whole. The house is nice. You, have you not have you, seen Blank Check? Movie? I've seen it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. it's a fantastic movie. It's great. <laughs> I really. I mean, Juice? you guys. You're, no, thank you. Not thirsty. <laughs> Your ideas have just been like I want the water slide now and I want the car as well. It's tough to think of like if I had a multi million dollar contract, what I would do with the money. First I'd pay off like student loans and stuff like that. And then I and then I don't know. I'd probably go I'd probably go for like a dream house, honestly. That would be and it's sort of similar to what you were saying with the water slide. I would just wanna get my dream house if I had enough money living there for the rest of my life and never pay mortgage on it. That'd be perfect. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. All right, so final question. Uh, how many touchdowns will Rob Gronkowski finish with in 2013? It's going to be under 10. What does he have now? Like he's at, what, four now? No, three. Touchdowns? How many touchdowns? Yeah, how many touchdowns? He has one. Didn't he have one, <laughs> yeah, he really he has one? Didn't he have one against Miami? Oh, no, no, no. That oh, one got yeah. called back. Yeah. You're right. Okay, fine. Sorry. So he has one. We're at uh, nine games into the season. We've got mm. seven games remaining, assuming that. Uh, uh, I didn't say the whole season. I just said Playoffs. in 2013. Oh, so you're including the playoffs? No, playoffs. no, no, no. Wait, then what? Oh, I'm confused. Just November and December. <laughs> oh, wow, come on. That's like, so just literally until. Okay, so let's see. That's uh, seven games remaining. And that I think they end in the last week of December, Brian. So, huh. That is a tough one, guys. I'm going to say 10 on the dot. I'm going to say 11. I'm going to go 8. He's going to have 10 more. Nine no, more to get to ten. 11, I think he's going to have total. eight more to get to nine. That's what I was I was going with. Eight, so, eight so you're more. so you're saying nine? Nine. I'm saying nine more to get to ten and more eleven. To eleven. Now will he have the most receiving yards on the team? I wouldn't be surprised actually because uh, Brady hasn't been throwing a lot to this is like uh, a Dobson. five A five and Tom, B yeah. kind of question. No, because okay. yeah, because uh, Julian Edelman was kind of uh, he had a great start to the year, but has been sort of inconsistent since. Danny Amendola has been hurt. Kenbrell Tompkins was a healthy scratch. Aaron Dobson's just now coming into his own. You know, besides that one game against, I think, Miami when uh, Gronk didn't have a good game, he had, what, 27 receiving yards? He's had back-to-back, well, not back-to-back, but he sandwiched that game with two 100 yards receiving games. So, yeah, I, I think he's going to lead the league, in, or not the league, the team in receiving yards. I think Gronk is the most reliable receiver that they have right now. I mean, they benched Tompkins yesterday, I mean, on Sunday. So, uh, Dobson, he's... You know, he's getting there. He's been consistent. He's, uh, this is his second consecutive week of scoring a touchdown. So he, he's, you know, he's progressing. But I, I think Gronk is your stable. Uh, he's, he's your Achilles heel to making um, a push in the playoffs. Yeah, uh, Tom Brady's favorite target right now, Rob Gronkowski. No doubt about and, it. Uh, and I think he's going to keep throwing to him. I think it also does open up a lot more for these other receivers. So I'm going to say no. I think Rob Gronkowski is going to have less than someone on this team, considering he also missed the first seven games of the season. So, 
Uh, I'm saying no, Rob Gronkowski won't lead the team, but he's going to be his favorite, Tom Brady's favorite target from here on out. He's close to 300 yards already, I believe. So, you know, he's getting there. Yeah. I mean, the reason I say is because I think with Gronk back in the lineup, it it allows for other people to open up a little bit more. You wouldn't have the same coverage uh, coming at you with the opposing defense. And, and all of a sudden, you know, Dobson has a great game the other day. had you, over 100 You give yards. me Gronk versus a linebacker or two linebackers, Gronk's all the way. Oh, yeah. All right, yeah. guys, up against another break, but we'll be right back here with uh, more Pat's talk on 1460 WXPR. Don't go anywhere. So, Justin, I was playing that video game, Forest Brigade, and it was pretty cool. I was running down this, like, digital path, and I met this digital frog, and he was all like... And then I went playing in this virtual stream where this water, it looked almost real. It was this whole electronic forest world. So what did you do? Well, my parents took me to the forest, the real forest, where I was running down this... Well, it was an actual path. Then I saw this real-life frog. It was all, like... Ribbit, and I saw an owl too. Then I played in this amazing stream with water around my ankles, like wet water. Then me and my sister and my parents sat around a campfire and told cool stories all night long. Oh, that's uh, pretty cool too. This weekend, unplug. Getting closer to nature can get you closer to your family. To find the forest nearest you, go to discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Confessions of a Potentially Perfect Parent brought to you by AdoptUsKids.org. I know more about cooking dinner for a party of 12 than about packing a lunch for a 12-year-old. I know kids like things like fish sticks. Filets, I get, but sticks? Maybe we can just compromise on mac and cheese. Can you make that with Bray? You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who would love to put up with you. Call 1-888-200-4005 or visit AdoptUsKids.org for more information. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt Us Kids, and the Ad Council. You're listening to The Sports Blast, wrapping up your week in Boston sports every Wednesday night, 7 to 9 p.m., right here on 1460 WXBR. And welcome back to the Sports Blast here on 1460 WXPR. Remember, you can call us at 508-588-9927. That's 508-588-WXPR. And check us out online, sportsblast.co. That is sportsblast.co. Keeping the talk with the Patriots, guys. I think this past Sunday we saw the most impressive Patriots win we have all year. Now, granted, it was against a really bad Steelers team, one of the worst defenses we've seen all year. But this has to be heading into the bye, now 7-2, and two, the most encouraging we have seen Tom Brady in the New England offense. And I, I think it's Tom Brady that you have to feel encouraged about. You know, he's he's been... He's been shaky, but, you know, he's been winning the games down the stretch. And that's what you want out of him. But the defense has been holding down the fort. And uh, Tom Brady actually stepped up, and it was Tom Brady of old. And it was against a vulnerable, a vulnerable uh, Steelers secondary. And uh, not much of a pass rush. He did get sacked five times, but um, he did have a good game. So uh, hats off to Tom Brady. He, he had a good performance. Yeah, I like this win uh, by the Patriots, and Tom Brady, I think, had his best uh, offensive performance of the season. For me, I look at the big win so far early in the year as being against the Saints. I I thought that that was at least a telltale sign for the defense, but offensively, uh, this was definitely the most encouragement that we that we've gotten so far from this offense. Tom Brady goes twenty three for thirty three, four hundred thirty two yards, four touchdowns, zero interceptions, gets sacked three times, three times, and Correction. and and uh, and the thing is, like at the defense to me, I was looking up some stats on this. They haven't really uh, faltered that much. I know we were talking a lot about their their passing. They don't defense. have a good stuff percentage, guys. They don't have a good stuff percentage, but. I was, I remember every everyone's been saying about uh, losing a keep to lead that this defense and the passing D was going to struggle and I think that they they've struggled a little bit more at getting uh, opposing teams off the mm-hmm. field but if you look at the three games prior to the Saints game where Talib went down and three games after it's basically the same so I got the stats here the against the Buccaneers. Uh, the Pats gave up 236 passing yards to Freeman. The Falcons, uh, Ryan got 421 passing yards. The Bengals, Dalton got 212 passing yards off the uh, off the Pats defense. Now in the three games since, 
against the Jets, Smith had 233 yards. Tannehill had 192. And Ben Lo- Roethlisberger the other night still had 400 <laughs> yards. Mm-hmm. And uh, it hasn't really been that much of a downturn. So I- I'm a little more encouraged now having seen the off- offense perform the way that they did against the Steelers. And uh, when Aqib Tlaib gets back and the defense is a little bit more healthy, it's, it's going to be good. Right. And you look at the defensive side of the ball and all the guys that they have lost uh, to season-ending IR, Vince Wilfork, Tommy Kelly. Luckily, Aqib Tlaib is not on that list. He should be back, if not next week, the week after that. But, you know, despite that, they have found ways to win because that really was the backbone of this team early. The offense couldn't get anything going. And now that the offense has shown you that they are capable, now that Gronk and Amendola are back, this is the most balanced that I have seen this Patriots team since maybe the Super Bowl era. Because for a long time... That one game. Yeah. Because, I mean, and again, I don't want to get carried away. It was one game. But... It's encouraging because since 2007, guys, this team has been all offense all the time. And for the first time that we have seen sort of that switch back to a defensive mentality as well as offense. And again, balance. Yeah. That's why I say the biggest win was the 13-10 win against the Jets. So that was a huge win. You mean the ugly one week two? Yeah, Yeah. that was was an ugly football game. It was an ugly football game. It doesn't matter how you win. But they won with defense. That you win. They won with defense. They right. did. And we haven't seen this team do that like like in like six, seven years. 35 <laughs> straight games now where the defense is forced to turn over. Steven Ridley had 26 carries for 115 yards and two touchdowns. Mm-hmm. Manimal. If you can get that from him too. every single week, that balance of offense is going to be stellar. I don't know why Belichick had him in the doghouse for the first like four yeah, weeks. Yeah, one I know, fumble. I, I, I know he fumbled. hates fumbles. <laughs> but, yeah. but he didn't hate it this week. You it, see what he said after the game? He said, oh. Those things happen. Uh, yeah, that was a, that was honestly a tough play. But for Paul me, it's, uh, absolutely beast moded that out of there. Yeah, I know he he ma- Palomalu made that play, so that's why I don't really blame Ridley for that fumble. Uh, other fumbles that Ridley has had this season, they've been his fault. He, he lack had of one, ball security. He had one other fumble. And, and granted, the Steelers <laughs> have given up one hundred and thirty one point three yards rushing yards per game, and that's thirty first in the NFL. Mm-hmm. So they they do struggle on uh, you know against the run Glad and I'm they struggle CJ to Spiller run the ball this week, then. <laughs> You're starting yeah. CJ Spiller. Oh yeah, <laughs> not Lashawn McCoy, Brian. You have to. <laughs> I don't have him on my fantasy. You don't have, oh, I figured. I've Ridley. He's on pie. So. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> but yeah, guys, Gronk, Amendola, Dobson, all over a hundred yards, and you know it obviously starts with Tom Brady, and he picked apart a bad defense. But if they can continue to play like this respectably throughout the rest of the year, you got to feel good. I mean, we were talking about this three or four shows ago about how. This team gets better as we get into the colder months, and that's sort of been the pattern for ten years now. And you know what's funny? It's it's the Pittsburgh Steelers. They're always going to be Pittsburgh Steelers. No, it doesn't not this year. Last two years. Yeah, but this year. Been, oh my gosh. They, yeah, but my thing is, suck. they still scored thirty-one points. Yeah, against, right, right against against a weak uh, run defense on the Patriots. I mean, the pass defense well, is still also, like top like ten. Garbage. Yeah, thirty one uh, points. Uh, yeah, thirty one sure, points. Sure, one yeah. touchdown came in garbage time. It was a close game at one point. I mean, sure, yeah. the, and then the Pats really had that touchdown. Pats then, took it away. Yeah. So I mean, it was close right up until the fourth quarter, and and it's encouraging to see the Pats actually break away from a team where we've had a lot of close games and games where they've had to come from behind in the last drive. It's been kind of that that sort of season. So nice to see on the flip side that they they actually pulled too. away. Brady. Yeah, this Brady was easily great Brady's this, this best game, game of yeah. the year, no he doubt. Four hundred sixty-two yards. Throw, so. Yeah, and a, and a thing that has been sort of talked about recently is Brady's swollen hand, and is that affecting his accuracy? You go back a couple games and you look at overthrowing guys, underthrowing guys, missing guys in the flat. And, you know, it, whatever he did to that hand, it seems okay now. The swelling's gone down and he's hitting guys. I don't know what happened if we were just blowing it out of proportion, but I thought I it was a bigger so. issue than it was. And the Steelers <laughs> had Ryan Clark. They have Troy Palomalu. They have a, a, a decent front four. I, uh, I mean, they've been all, they've been all right uh, passing-wise, uh, rush, you know, giving up a lot of rushing yards, of course. But without Marquise Pouncey on the offensive line, then you have Larry Foote out for the year, too, on the defensive side of the ball. That really doesn't help either, so you can kind of feel their pain, but at the same time, you know, the Pats were struggling to get that balance, and they got it from both sides of the ball. Yeah, and and I mean, to me, there's something wrong with the Steelers this season. Obviously, if they were the same Steelers, they wouldn't be where they are right now at 2-6, two, two and six, correct? Mm-hmm. So I, Their offense is scary, though. Their offense, I mean, it can it can help them obviously, but it's it hasn't. There's something wrong with the team itself. I, I don't yeah. watch the Steelers enough to know why they're two and six, but when you're two and six, 
there's something uh, inherently wrong it, within your within your locker room, out on the field. Something's not clicking. So this, to me, it's a, again, it's an encouraging win for me because the offense busted out the way that it did. But I don't look at it as all right. Here we go. The Pats are about to get the train rolling here. Mm-hmm. I think they've got some tougher matchups coming up, and we'll see how they do against some of the teams. However, I think there's no way that this team finishes under 12 and 4 this year, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it was kind of like an up and down game early on. Three. I think 13 and 3 as well. I was yeah. 12 and 4 I had them at, like uh, coming into training camp, looking at what happened this off season, I had him at 10 and 6. Then after I saw the preseason and I saw Cambrell Tompkins do what he was doing and we'll get to him. That's actually one thing I want to talk about and seeing how Brady actually was having a pretty decent preseason. I said, "You know what? 11 and 5." Yeah. I feel pretty good about this team. Then after weeks one and two against the Bills and the Jets, I said, okay, I was right originally, 10-6. and six. And So stay, it's going to have been up and down. You know? <laughs> and to stay on the AFC East, Jericho Cotri, a former Jet, yep. had a heck of a game too. Kyle Errington was getting burned. He was getting burnt. But at the same time, Emmanuel Sanders too. The secondary stepped up. Dennard, phenomenal. See, that's the thing about Arrington. He's good as a slot corner, but he's not good as a right or left corner. And we yeah. saw that last year and the year before. And that's why when he was awarded with that, I believe, four-year extension to come back to play for the Patriots, I said, no way. Dante yeah. Hightower played a good game. Hightower too. has been good. Yeah, like stepping recently, up in the like of, after he got uh, that dot off of him after he was like supposed to be like a big, important part. He, uh, I mean, this past week he got hit by a pass, but he's not playing the ball. He's playing off the ball, so... He 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 played his spot, his p- part so yeah and and the way um you know the the secondary has played together without t- uh, a key to leap I mean injuries across the board and that's what makes the Patriots even more special at their record of what seven and two now mm-hmm. they just don't they don't have as many guys on each side of the ball as you'd expect them to coming into training camp. So who do they lose to the rest of the way? Well, that's what I was that's what I was going to ask you guys. So the rest of the way they got Carolina at 5 and 3, Denver 7 and 1, Houston's 2 and 6, Cleveland's 4 and 5, Miami's 4 and 4, Baltimore 3 and 5 and Buffalo 3 and 6. The only team they lose to there Denver. is Denver. No. And, and I mean no. they could, I'm saying Carolina the only team they should lose to me. is Denver. No, Carolina's Carolina has won 4 in a row, but I think they at this point they're playing good enough football heading into the bye getting good rest. I think they should be able to be able to walk Do into Carolina know and the beat them. Carolina defense. That's going to No, they've got a, they've got a, they've got a great Brady. defense. Carolina was why I said 12 and 4 instead of 13 and 3 and instead of 13 and 3. Yeah. And we also don't know how uh, how Baltimore is going to look at the very end of the season. Baltimore no matter how good or bad they are, they always give the Patriots it's a fight, and I know a lot Don't of guys like... Don't sleep on my Dolphins and Sun Life Stadium. That's all <laughs> no, I can say. We'll we'll it's Sun Life Stadium. Stadium. Is there still sunlight in that stadium? <laughs> sun Life. <laughs> if Mike, uh, Mike Wallace can't see anything, so it must yeah. be dark in there. Yeah. <laughs> so guys, going back to uh, Kembrell Tompkins, something that uh, Mark brought up initially when we went into the Patriots talk. A healthy scratch in, in last week's game. Uh, and he just ha- wasn't playing well originally in the two games before that against the Jets and the Dolphins. Well, Austin Collie Austin Austin Call- Call- was cut. He yeah, was cut, so hit. that, that helps And Laquan Hopkins Williams a got uh, right, but, activated from the practice squad. Exactly, but my, ori- my question is, look, I know the kid's struggling over the last few games. He wasn't even targeted, I believe, in the Miami game at all. But is that reason to just now list him as an inactive from what we saw from Tompkins in the preseason? He was the most saw? consistent receiver in the preseason and preseason the first five. Preseason doesn't tell anything. In the it first five, it doesn't, first five Brian, games. Yeah, no, but I mean, he still looked like he belonged out there. My thing was, I think the Pats really wanted to give Brady a certain amount of options. Because if you give Brady too many weapons... He really. Like, I feel like Dobson is um, better at read, uh, reading routes and readjusting. Well, than when he's not Andrew dropping Tompkins. passes, although he's really improved in that sense. This last game exactly. was the best that drop uh, Dobson has had. <laughs> yeah. I did it again. I agree. That Dobson has had uh, in his career so far, but I just don't like the idea of giving up on Tompkins so quickly. I saw him as sort of the young Troy Brown or the young Dion Branch, that kind of that fourth or fifth option that's just going to be there when you need him. He's not going to be the guy that's going to be racking up a ton of yards at the end of the year. He's just a guy that you want out there because he's reliable. He can run his routes and he can make good catches. Yeah, but you have Amendola, Dobson, Edelman, and Gronk. Gronkowski. That's a lot of options for Tom Brady. So I'm not saying Cambrell Tompkins has to be out there every snap, but a reliable fourth or fifth option for yeah. Tompkins? He's a, look, he's an undrafted free agent. I'm not saying make this kid your number one target. That's not going to happen. Mm. But in terms of depth, to have him around, why was he in, in an active? I think he could still... He still can get out there and give you some sort of value, is all I'm saying. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we see where this where this winds up going. He, he could be out there again, you know, sooner than later. And, and I, I just, uh, early in the season, you know, there was definitely promise. Tompkins was dropping balls just like Dobson was. And, and it's a learning curve for young guys like this, especially where he's an undrafted guy. Not saying that that makes you any more or less talented. But there's but less risk. There's probably a slight, a slightly bigger learning curve for for a guy like that. And there's a reason he went undrafted. You know, like mm-hmm. maybe maybe it is going to take Tompkins a little while longer to to get into the swing of things. But I agree, he looks like a guy who, when he gets it, he's going to to be a key contributor. And I like the comparison to Troy Brown. If if he gets to that point. Great guy to have on your bench and to have him be out there for any amount of snaps that you can have him out there. And from the Falcons game on, he he was the he was given Tom Brady an option downfield. And I feel like if you like I said, I, I said this in previous shows, if you want a consistent receiver, you have to give the ball to him multiple times to gain confidence, give him some kind of chemistry with the quarterback and wide receiver tandem. Right. Yeah. No, and and again, going back to uh, just why he may not be playing, it could be disciplinary. It might be just the fact that he didn't figure to be a part of the offense. I don't. You know, I just don't know. And it'll be something that'll be interesting to watch. But I think that Campbell Tompkins will find himself a major part of this team at some point. You know, like we said, he went undrafted. He was not taken. That's got to be a chip on his shoulder. That's going to be a reason for him to play his hardest and prove that he belongs on the team. And he's never going to be a star. You know that I mean, when Aaron Dobson was brought to New England, I knew he was going to be the next guy that they were going to groom to be their next young gun Randy wide receiver. Moss. There, you know, I refrained from uh, comparing Marshall. a rookie to that, yeah, exactly. That, that was the that comparison. Over the shoulder catch was beautiful. that was very Moss like. Yeah. That, yeah. was, that was the most beautiful catch. I've seen that's all that's the thing: the talent's definitely there for these young guys, and uh, to it's it's again, it's sort of like what we're talking about with the, with the Red Sox. Maybe because of the history of the team, we have such high expectations for all these guys. It's not really an ability to learn on the fly for a young guy like Tompkins. So With if, Tom he's, Brady, if he's though? well, Dobson well, that's is what I'm also saying. young. If you can't like the Patriots as an organization uh, have always been a, the type of team where if you don't get it, if you're not functioning within the process of the game, that's you're not I, you're not going to be on the field. Cool. That's yeah. why Alter Senko was yeah. gone, and yeah. that's and mm-hmm. that's probably why Tompkins isn't playing right now. We don't see everything that happens obviously behind the scenes, but I think that's why Tompkins isn't on the field. There's something where he's just. Uh, he might, he might have to you know, have that learning curve go a little bit longer for him. All right, another quick commercial break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back here on the Sports Blast, 1460 WXBR. Blue is my favorite color. What's yours? What's yours? Red is my favorite color. What's yours? What's yours? Well, yeller is sweller for this little feller. And me, I'm keen on green. So what's your favorite color? Tell us, please. Kids will spend 20 minutes listening to songs like what's this. What's your favorite color? Tell us, please. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite How about two minutes to brush their teeth? Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. For fun two-minute videos to watch while brushing, visit 2min2x.org. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. A message from the Partnership for Healthy Mouths, Healthy Lives and the Ad Council. Me, a cat, moving in with a new human. It took a little getting used to. She has these weird games she likes to play, like this giant feather. She sticks it in my face. I swat it away. She sticks it in my face. I swat it away. It's almost like she thinks I enjoy it. But seeing how much fun she gets out of it, well, I guess it makes it all worth it. Humans. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. You're listening to The Sports Blast. Getting you over the hump every Wednesday, 7 to 9 p.m. Right here on 1460 WXBR. Classic. And welcome back to the Sports Blast 1460 WXBR. Guys, I want to talk about this Richie Incognito story that has basically blown up over the web and the media and everything. Unless you've been living under a rock, I'm sure everyone is well aware of what is going on in Miami right now. And Mark, something you actually brought to my attention was that 
head coach of the Miami Dolphins, Joe Philbin, may have actually been partially, if not the very cause. responsible, the court, the 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 cause of this whole thing. You know what? What was it that you told me? You said before the show that Joe Philbin had actually told Richie Incognito, who's a guard for the Miami Dolphins, to go up to uh, what's his name, um, uh, Martin, uh, Jonathan Martin, Jonathan Martin, who was also on the offensive line, right. And I don't know if he necessarily said, I want you to leave a nasty voicemail yeah. with a bunch of, you know, obscenities and vulgarities Probably and not. things like that. But he said, toughen this kid up. And that's a very vague way to put it. And why even put, uh, toughen him up for what? And you know what's uh, In the beginning of the season, they put him on the six-player um, council. And it's basically a leadership group for the locker room. So if anything like this goes on, you know, a player has someone to look go to as like a mentor or a look for help, you know. So uh Joe Philbin was like, you know what? Richie, go go talk to Jonathan Martin. Ha- have him um have him get tougher, you know? So yeah, he he went about getting uh too rough with the kid and, you know, and and Jonathan Martin took it the wrong way. And I really feel like if if Did you see Joe, him in the bar? <laughs> my thing was Joe Philbin Joe mind. Philbin's the main cause of this because Richie Incognito has a history, a troubling history. Yeah, it was St. Louis. St. Louis, Nebraska. Nebraska. I actually have a list here, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but there's at least 20 bullet points here dating back to Nebraska, going into the NFL, of incidents that Richie Incognito has had. So this is not an isolated event. No, and that's my point. That's why I think Joe Philbin should have went to either um, Mike Pouncey or maybe John Jerry, like, some uh, or Cameron Wake, some uh, or t- Ryan Tannehill. I can name all of them, but my thing was Richie Incognito had a past, a troubling past, and you go and ask him to give advice to somebody else. Richie Incognito needs advice. He needs advice on his life, his his playing career. He's just been he's been out of this out of this world. He's been so bad to the media, to the fans. And to the the state of Florida, and you know, I I can go on and on. Uh, Richie Incognito, I'll say, is a evil person in society. I I really feel like yeah, it, and that voicemail just said it all. I mean, that's what it, it basically boils down to. This guy is is messed up from whatever from whatever happened to him uh, over the course of his life. This guy is obviously a bully and and somebody that shouldn't have been trusted with any type of leadership role on any team in the NFL. And the reason we talk about a guy like this is because he's a public figure in the NFL. If this is just a normal guy uh, spewing this kind of hate, you know, someone someone takes care of a guy like that. He's an overprivileged person who thought that he could get away with doing whatever he wanted because he's a pro NFL player. Did you see the text messages he sent too? They're they're yeah. all abhorrent. Ridiculous. It's it's absolutely insane it's that mo- that a Jonathan guy like Martin's this. Jonathan Martin's mom. It, it's I know I know it's absolute it's it's awful. And to do it to a teammate, you're a professional. I understand the the whole thought of hey, go toughen this kid up. It happens on almost every team from from high school sports all the way up to the pros. Somebody might need a little bit of toughening up, but there's a certain way to go about it. You don't do it like this. This is, I mean, the, the guys and, yeah. had to check in to a, to a hospital because of emotional distress. Obviously, there was something wrong with, with Incognito to the point where it was beyond a hazing or teasing right. or anything and, and like that. And there's a him difference up. between rookie hazing and bullying and even what I would call maybe a hate crime, borderline hate crime. There's a difference between, hey, you know, rookie, pick up my shoulder pads and bring him to practice. That's hazing. Yeah. Go That's buy, playful. Go buy I still can't you believe know? that. That's some of the Dolphins players like stood want by. Him back. That's no, motivation. They want him back. That's Look, motivation in a positive way. It doesn't. It doesn't necessarily shock me that the Dolphins are standing by him because I think as an organization they've got some problems. But I, I mean, when when stuff like this Sorry, happens, no, you you always <laughs> they're an inconsistent franchise. Yeah. You, they really are. You always they'll win, they'll win one week. The next week, somebody will go out and get a DUI. That's just how the Dolphins are. And look, you, you, you're you supposed to be able to look to leaders within the organization. And this guy was appointed as a leader. I mean, you said it, Mark. This this guy gets appointed to, to help the young the players leader. come along and, and, to, and to make their way into the NFL. And this is just obviously not the way you do it. And it's it, the... the the important nature of the message is just, it's just disgusting to hear anybody right, talk like right. that. And, and if you look Ridiculous. at what exactly he said to Martin, which obviously we won't repeat, but if you Can't. look at what was said, you know, you, you look at, well, first of all, Richie Incognito, 
is is a white guy, and he is saying something like that to a black man who is Martin, yeah. and he is getting support from, from the teammates. Miami Dolphins. I mean, here's my I mean, thing. I can't believe I w- that. I wouldn't doubt that that kind of language happens in a NFL lo- NFL locker room, yeah. without a doubt. But since it was recorded, it's on a voicemail, and you know. It's it's a big to do, and it should be a big to do without a doubt, mm-hmm. because you don't use that type of language towards anybody, right? Anybody. And, and, and the reason he's getting support apparently is because oh, you know, Richie Incognito, despite being white, had the same kind of upbringing that we did. But Martin, oh, he's from this privileged family, and he's you know well educated, so we don't accept him. We don't accept him. We're rolling with Incognito. It's ridiculous the support that Incognito is getting from his teammates. If this is in fact true, and during Hard Narks last year. Um, Joe Philbin did not take any crap from any of the Dolphins. Chad Ochocinco, he had two hiccups, and he was out of there. Yep. Why did Joe Philbin go to Richie Incognito for, for, to, to give advice to Jonathan Martin? It just blows my mind. The guy has a history of bad news. He's a bad news he player. He doesn't get the benefit of the doubt. He doesn't here. get benefit of the doubt. No, he should not be the ringleader for this six-player council. It should be Ryan Tannehill. He should have a voice, a strong voice, and he doesn't have a presence right now. And that's why he actually is playing bad because he should be the guy. The cor- every quarterback on, the, on an NFL team is important, and Ryan Tannehill needs to step up and he needs to speak. Well, you know, I think right there it's, it's strong negative energy combats. Uh, it basically produces weak positive energy. And when you have a guy like that, Who's, I mean, we all saw the TMZ video. I don't know how many listeners mm-hmm. might have seen it, but this guy is parading around the bar screaming expletives left and right. He's, he's marching around, and he's just a meathead. The guy should not be the he's leader. He's your typical of any, fraternity jack. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Spot fraternity. on with that explanation. And seriously, this guy, this guy had no right to even be in the league. There was, there was obviously a huge character issue with him that, People just ignored. I mean, this isn't something that people miss. It's something people ignore. Yeah. That's and that's on that's on every team that has ever allowed this guy to play for them. And it'll be interesting to see what happens from here on out. I think he's going to be done in Miami. He will probably stick There's around. There's more in the to NFL. come. There, there will be yeah, some team will take a chance on him, but Richie Incognito is at least done with this franchise. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back with Mike Lofty here on the Sports Blast. You won't want to miss it. Your boy Fifty Cent, and I'm here with Scott. Hi there. Scott's a true family man, but he might not catch your attention right away, so I'm lending my voice. Now, what happened, Scott? Well, 50, I never thought it would be me. I was just your everyday, middle-class working American. But then I lost my job and still had a family of four to feed. I was afraid. You know, I was expecting people to be judgmental about me needing help, but I didn't run into any of that. The food bank is about more than just meals. It's about encouraging and helping people when they need it most. Today, one in six Americans don't know where their next meal is coming from. Scott here could be your neighbor, your co-worker, your friend. He's just like you, and you probably don't even know he's struggling. But you can make a difference in Scott's life today. So visit feedinamerica.org slash hunger and find a local food bank to help. I'm Scott. And I'm 50 Cent. Together, we are Feeding America. A message from Feeding America and the Ad Council. Time now for your WXBR Sports Blast headlines. The Boston Red Sox are World Series champions after beating the St. Louis Cardinals 6-1 in Game 6 exactly one week ago, winning the series four games to two. It's the Sox' third World Series championship since 2004. But Game 6 marked the first time that the Sox have clinched the World Series title at Fenway Park since 1918. The Beards went 97-65 and during the regular season. Major League Baseball named John Farrell. AL Manager of the Year, David Ortiz, was your World Series MVP. Dustin Pedroia and Shane Victorino each won Gold Glove Awards. Red Sox fans got to celebrate the victory at the Rolling Rally, which took place this Saturday. The New England Patriots enjoy a bye week in Week 10. They're coming off a 55-31 victory against the Steelers. Their next game is a Monday night football matchup November 18th against the Carolina Panthers. Rob Ninkovich practiced on Tuesday after being sidelined in the second half of Sunday's game with an apparent foot injury. The Boston Bruins have lost four of their last five games, their latest loss coming last night against the Dallas Stars. The Bees lost in a shootout as former Bruins Tyler Sagan and Rich Peverly both scored in the shootout, 
to put the Bruins away by a final of 3-2. to two. Good news for the Bruins. Louis Erickson was back on the ice last night against Dallas after missing five games with a concussion. The Bees take on the Florida Panthers tomorrow night, face-off at 7 o'clock. The Boston Celtics are 0-4 to start their season. They lost their most recent game on Monday night, 95-88 to against the Memphis Grizzlies. And, a, and tonight they will take on the Jazz in a battle of winless teams as rookie head coach Brad Stevens and the Celtics try to right the ship. Tip-off is at 7.30. Those are your Sports Blast headlines. Be sure to check out our website for your favorite Sports Blast segments and guest interviews as well as video highlights of the Red Sox rolling rally at www.sportsblast.co and tweet us at 1460 Sports Blast. Again, that's at 1460 Sports Blast. I'm David Pollard. Don't go anywhere. The Sports Blast continues right now. The Sports Blast with Ashish Sharma, Brian Roach, David Pollard, and Mark Lazell. 1460 WXBR. And welcome back to the Sports Blast 1460 WXBR. Joining us now from the Patriot Ledger, we have Mike Loftus to talk some Bruins. How are you doing, Mike? Oh, Mike is not on with us just yet, but uh, we are going to transition into some Bruins talk right now. I think we have him on the line now. Mike Loftus of the Patriot Ledger, are you there? I (laughs) seem to be. (laughs) (laughs) A little bit of technical difficulty, but glad to have you on board with us, Mike. Um, I just want to talk about the return of Tyler Sagan last night, Mike. Uh, Between the Bruins and the Stars, obviously the big deal that sent Tyler Sagan and uh, Rich Pervely to Dallas and got back Louis Erickson. Who, in your opinion, excluding just last night, got the better end of that deal? Well, I mean, obviously, you look at the final. um, And, you know, Sagan scored a big goal in the the shootout to extend it, and Pervely got, you know, Pervely got the winner. So, you know, in this episode, Dallas wins it. Um, You know, Erickson came back last night from a concussion, and I don't think he was... I don't think he was quite himself, and um, you know the other player that's uh, that's on the Bruins roster, who's actually had a pretty decent start, Riley Smith. Um, not much of a game for him either. So, I mean, it, it, to be honest, it really wasn't a very good game for very many guys on either team. Um, but you know, if if, if you, if you want to measure it as you know the, the, the trade, obviously Dallas. You know, Dallas wins last night. Hey, Mike, uh, so the Bruins, they they haven't really looked too good of late. Uh, they've dropped four out of their last five games, picking up just three points in the process. Uh, it seems to me like they're just having a little bit of trouble staying focused for a full 60 minutes. What do you think is up with the Bruins right now, and, and how do you think they fix it? Well, I mean, I don't – I honestly, I'm not sure that they know um, because they've, they've found, you know, they found really, like, different ways to lose. They, they, they really shouldn't have lost that game last night. I thought they lost it for a couple of different reasons. Right. They, you know, 15 shots, I think, in the first 10 minutes. And they could have had four goals, maybe. And instead, it's just a 1-1 tie. You know, so that's that's not good enough. They, you know, they haven't been, um, they haven't done very well lately at, at, you know, taking advantage of, you know, the good chances they've had to score. And then another thing that you don't see, you know, a good Bruins team do, or t- or a Bruins team do when they're playing well, is they finally did take a lead in the third period, and, a, and just like a bad, bad line change, which is a, you know, that's a mental mistake, gives a guy a breakaway. You know, Dennis Seidenberg has to haul a guy down. It results in a penalty shot, and you know now you got now you get a tie game in overtime. So it, it it seems to be, it seems to be a little bit of a of a different thing each game, but. I think maybe the one consistent thing is they they've really had a hard time, you know, getting consistent scoring, um, you know, particularly on the second and third lines. Now, whether that's you know adjustments to guys like Louis Erickson, who has been in and out of the lineup, um, they haven't had you know Carl Soderberg for the whole year, and I don't I think the jury is still out on whether he's you know a full time NHL guy. So they still have some issues, and I guess. At the start of the season, you know they they were able to overcome them, but you know now you know now you you know you get some other teams that have gotten you know gotten their footing and um, teams are a little bit more even than they were at the start. So could be any number of reasons, but um, they've got a five game homestand, and um, you know they really I mean I, I think they're looking at this these this next week you know as as a time that they've really got to sort of you know, get their acts together and, and, and focus more. I mean, I think that's probably a big part of it, too. You know, okay. right, it's not there all 60 minutes. 
Yeah, so you, you were talking about uh, Louis Erickson. He wasn't quite himself last night. So uh, Louis er- Erickson missed five games prior to last night's game with a concussion. Uh, how do you think he looked in his return? He, he was okay. Um, you know, he, he, he had just – it took him a little while, I think, to adjust. He started with – you know, I mean, you know, you think it's like every player's dream, and it kind of is, you know, to, to get to play with Patrice Bergeron. But, you know, Erickson was in Dallas for eight years. And, uh, you know, it's just the Bruins play a little bit of a different game. He's seen opponents he hasn't seen that much. So he had just started to kind of turn a corner and play the game that the Bruins expect of him when he when he got that concussion. So, you know, I, I think, you know, obviously between, you know, I mean, he missed five games. And, uh, you know, now he's got to come back and not necessarily start square one. You know, you would think he'd be better tomorrow night against Florida with another day of practice and, a, you know, and a game under his belt. Um, it's an interesting thing because, you know, he's he's playing on that second line. He, he replaces Tyler Sagan. And, you know, Erickson's a very good player, but he's, he's, he's also a very different player than Sagan. So there's been an adjustment period, I think, for Bergeron, too. Bergeron and Sagan were together for, you know, um, you know, pretty much two full years, after, you know, in, in the time that Mark Recchi retired. And, um, and the same thing can be said with, uh, with Marshawn. It's, uh, it's a different guy, and, you know, it hasn't quite gelled yet. Hi, Mark. We're 14 games into the season right now. David Krejci is a point-a-game guy. This line of Krejci, Lucic, and Aginla, and Ginla has combined now for 12 goals and 24 assists between the three of them. What have you liked most about this line so far this season, and is there anything you believe they can improve on? Um, as far as the improvement, it's, they haven't been as good during the slump as they were, or during the team slump as they were before it. And I think that's, you know, that's always been not necessarily a knock on Krejci and Lucic, but, you know, it has been an issue where they've, you know, it, they've had these really nice runs and then kind of disappeared for three or four games. So I think, I think that's going to definitely be a focus for those two this year, particularly Lucic, because last year was just so, you know, so difficult for him. He was a healthy scratch at one point, which was kind of a famous move. And he doesn't, you know, He's a pretty proud guy. He doesn't want to go through that again. Um, I think Aginla is is a is a is a great replacement for Nathan Horton, um, and I think there's like that little intangible thing there. He's you know this is a Hall of Fame player who still has something left, but he's never won a Stanley Cup. And I think you know the Bruins are uh, the Bruins are kind of you know attuned to that. So it, it's been it's been a really good line, and I think you know one of the reasons the Bruins are you know have kind of an average record right now is that nobody has scored as consistently as they do. If you look at their scoring now, you know the number two guy on the team in goals is Tory Krug, and he's a rookie. So you know they they've got to address that. Yeah, the uh, the Atlantic Division this year, Mike, is pretty loaded up. And right yeah. right now, you got Tampa Bay, Toronto, and Detroit all with twenty points. You got Montreal tied with the Bruins for seventeen, and you also can't forget about Ottawa because they've got a really talented squad up there too. Um, if you had to pick the team that scares you the most in this division, who would it be? Um, you know, I I actually I might even I might say Toronto. Um, I don't I don't know what. You know the Bruins have actually handled Tampa, you know, fairly easily in a couple mm-hmm. of games already, and I think they play again Monday. Um, you know, so I mean, I think that's going to tell a little bit more about whether Tampa's a a real threat. Um, you know, the, the Bruins, the Bruins should be, you know, the Bruins should be up there, but you know, Toronto really seems to, you know, they may have finally turned a corner right. up there. Um, you know, that was a was a terrible loss for them last year. Mm-hmm. You know, in the first round of the Bruins, but I, I think you know they've they've done very very good at coming back. I mean, that's the kind of thing that you know that can wreck you for a while, and uh, they haven't let them. Um, very very powerful team. There's always you know offensively. There's always that question about goaltending, but they but they addressed it. Right. You know, by adding adding Bernier, um, so they get good competition in in that and. Um, they, you know, they're in Boston on Saturday night, and uh, that's you know that's going to be a really interesting game. Yeah, and uh, and speaking of that, I mean the Bruins, they go up against a team like Florida tomorrow. It's sort of almost like oh, we've got the Panthers tomorrow, but we've got Toronto coming up Saturday. 
So, I mean, my question for tomorrow's game, because if this if they go up against a Panthers team that really they should beat and they happen to lose that game, then maybe people start to worry about this Bruins team. But other than winning the game tomorrow night, what would you look for from the Bruins tomorrow against the Panthers? I, I think, you know, I mean, I think it's got to be, you know, a 60-minute game or close. That's that's really what they've, what they've lacked. Um, and I think, you know... The Bruins have a lot of confidence. They've been together for a long time, and, and there's a tendency on their part, uh, I think, when, when, a, when a problem comes up and they address it, then they, they, they sort of think, like, every okay, everything's okay now. And I think we saw that last night. They had started so many games so poorly that when they came out and had that excellent start last night, I think they just kind of let their foot off the gas, thinking, okay, you know, we had our good start, that was our problem, we solved our problem, we're good to go. And, you know, somebody forgot to tell Dallas, you know. So <laughs> so Dallas hung around and hung around, and, you know, they made, the, they made the best of their chances. So I think, you know, the Bruins really, regardless of how they start, obviously they want to start well, but, you know, whether they start well and score a lot, whether they start well and don't score, they just have to, you know, start well and, and, and continue it. You know, it's just like a consistent effort, I think, is, is um, and a consistent push, I think, is, is really, that would be their goal for tomorrow night. Awesome. Good stuff, Mike. Really appreciate you joining us tonight on the Sports Blast. No problem. Thank you guys for having me. Appreciate it. All right. All right. Thanks, Mike. Mike Loftus of the Patriot Ledger. And, uh, you know, some interesting stuff. I don't really know what to uh, pinpoint with the Bruins' recent struggles. Dave, obviously, you being the Bruins guy probably uh, would have a better idea. But it's kind of been a struggle this year. And maybe it's just sort of something we've come to accept is during the regular season, they'll sleepwalk through certain games. And then somehow in the postseason, just it'll all come together. Yeah, I mean, this is it's, – it's tricky because, honestly, this is a, a Bruins team that – you look at it on paper, they should probably be a little better than their record suggests right now. And they don't, they're don't they not doing that awful. They're, uh, they're tied in fourth in the division with 17 points with Montreal, and the three teams in front of them all have 20. They're in a tough division, and right now I kind of look at it and I say this team has too many two-way forwards and uh, and that's been that's always been something with the Bruins. That's they're, why they should have kept Sagan. They're so focused on defense, <laughs> and they shouldn't have kept Sagan. I mean, I know that I know that the guy. Listen, he scored in the shootout last night, and it was a bullet. What a shot the guy and took! Peverly scored too. Yeah, and Peverly too. Because he had the that? time of day. But I'll, sure. that's what I'm saying. Tyler Sagan is the best player you could ask Stick for with no it. resistance in front of him whatsoever. If there were no other players on the ice. Tyler Sagan's my guy yeah. all the time. Yeah. Guy, the guy's going to do fantastic down in Dallas all season long. He, I'm telling you, I've said it before. He's going to get 30 goals, 30 assists down in Dallas, 60-point season, and we're all going to be up here going, "What? where was that guy up in Boston? It's because the Bruins don't play that sort of game. They don't want a center who's going to hang out in the slot and try and shoot for 30 goals a season. They want a guy like Louis Erickson who's a two-way forward. The problem with that is you have these scoring droughts with a team like the Bruins, because the way that they score goals is by dumping the puck in, getting in there on the forecheck, and grinding out games. You can't really... Tipping in goals. Yeah, right. Rebounds. Right. Rebounds are huge. And, and you can't really grind out wins for an entire 82-game season. You do need that balance between offense and defense. And right now, to me, and, and Mike just mentioned it, the guy with the most offensive prowess right now is Tory Krug, and he's a rookie yeah. defenseman. That that shouldn't be your most offensively no. minded guy on the ice. Kirk has been unbelievable though. Yeah, and, he doesn't feel like a rookie to me that. And Dave, I think the problem is the main conflict of this, you know, this team right now is they can't close out games. Yeah, which they, is unlike them. They have had uh, a one goal one goal deficit in 3 games so mm-hmm. far this season. Mm-hmm. And they have scored uh 3 goals in one game and the rest 2 goals or fewer in the, in the uh the rest, right, right. So they they haven't just they, they haven't brought it to the table, and you know they have had uh, strong starts, but they just can't close it out. The the Bruins have uh, some outrageous record under Claude Julian when they take a lead into the third period. The Bruins are one of the best teams, and and they have been the past four seasons at shutting teams down when they get the lead. And it's something that they they've kind of struggled with this season. I mean, you were they were up against New Jersey uh, a couple Saturdays ago. They blow that game, and then they're up against Dallas last night with three minutes left. 
Zdeno Chara gets off the ice, an ill-advised line change, and uh, Seidenberg has to take a trip, which leads to a penalty shot. Dallas gets the tying goal. They can't put another one in a pass letting in uh, at the end of the third period or overtime. And you go up against a guy like Tyler Sagan in a shootout. You, Sagan's going to score every do. time. Yeah. And the only bright spot on this team right now is Tuka Rask. He's playing great. Uh, tu- Tuka usual. has allowed 1.7 goals against, 941 save percentage, 334 saves this season. He's literally saving the Bruins from from going uh, downhill. And there's there's been a couple of games where Tuka's really stood on, stood on his head. The San Jose Sharks game stands out to me the most because that guy, that that game, they got brutally outshot. And Tuka, yeah. and the Sharks are, are no team to scoff at when it comes to getting 40 shots on net. Those are quality chances. And Tuka Rask, uh, he's been up to, the, up to the challenge so far this season. All right, final break of the evening here on the Sports Blast. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back here with the Blast Off on 1460 WXBR. We can make it better now. Come on, can we do it? Yeah, you know that we can. We'll rope it up. Cause we know how to jump. We'll roll it out. Cause we know how to skate. We'll cut it down. Cut it down. Cause we know what to eat. We'll swap it out. We eat healthy stuff. Can we do it? Yeah, you know that we can. Can we do it? Today's a good day to grab your kids and hang out with them for an hour. Dance, walk, play a sport, or cook a healthy meal. Because just moving a little and eating better every day can help make you and your child healthier. Can we do it? Yeah, you know that we can. We'll ball it up. Because we know how to hoop. We'll mess around. Because we know how to play. We'll drop it down. Because we know how to dance. We'll veg it up. Veg it up. Search We Can online to find doable tips and activities that you can use every day to keep you and your kids healthy. Remember, that's We Can. A message from the Ad Council, HHS, and NIH's We Can program. T minus 15. We will go out with the bag. Time out. For blast off. Blast off. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good things must come to an end. Good things need to burn out at 150 seconds. Sports Blast, wrapping up your week at Boston Sports every Wednesday night, 7 to 9 p.m. The Jays are down to their last strike. He try to bury this split finger in the dirt. Get out of here. Hey, struck him out. Red Sox win from worst to first in 2013. The AL East belongs to the Boston Red Sox. This is our f***ing city. We come together to celebrate life and to walk our cities and to cheer for our teams. When the Sox, Celtics, and Patriots, or Bruins, are champions again, to the chagrin of New York and Chicago fans, the crowds will gather and watch a parade go down Boylston Street. And nobody but a big day on freedom. Here's the 2-2. And a swing and a miss. And the Boston Red Sox are moving on. Strikeout starts the inning, and that's five already for Sanchez. That's strike three, and that's strikeout number eight. Sanchez strikes out the side. A strikeout is the end. Another strikeout. Tigers win game one. Combined to strike down 17 Red Sox batters. Uh, and a lot of swing and miss, obviously. It's a strike, and he got a look at it. Strikeout, it's the end. Strikeout to start the end. Another strikeout, number nine. A strikeout. That's number 10. It's a one, two. Another strikeout, that's 12. Two out. They've got Ortiz, who's never homered against Benoit. Red Sox trailing 5 to 1, and Poppy gets in. Benoit delivers. Swing and a high knee drive in the right field. That one's going to the right. Hunter on the move. Racing back. It's over his head. It's gone. It's in the bullpen. This game is tied. This game is tied. David Ortiz. What do you think of that? Behind on the count. 3 to 1. That's a base hit. Red Sox win it. John Lackey. 
obviously, yeah, he's a great pitcher, but uh, when you pitch this time of year, you're not going to go against anybody that's not pretty good. It's been a game of missed opportunities, yet still in front for the Tigers. The count's 0 and 2 on Victorino. That's hit well into the corner. It is gone. A grand slam. 5 2 Boston in the seventh. It's a money play. It's a money play. I don't care if he was awful 23 or whatever. Money player come through at the right time, and he did. And now you couldn't have asked for a better series. It, it, it tested everything that we had, pushed us to the limits. Team.